very warm welcome on this Friday morning. Welcome to the show. And we've got another fabulous guest on this morning uh, in Roman Harris from Google. Uh, just before I get to that, just a reminder for those, uh, some will know, but, but for the newcomers, the premise of the show as, as ever is, uh, if this, you can see this, is, is this book and Oh, The Places You'll Go, a fabulous book about uh, life's journey. And you will be happy, successful, content and fulfilled, but just not every day. And it's actually life's bumps and undulations that make for an interesting story and, and give you energy. So all of our inspiring speakers and guests have showed us ways that they've managed through difficult times through to, through to try it. And so to Ronan, well, um, welcome Ronan. Um, Morning. Now, to, to introduce Ronan briefly, he, actually probably Ronan doesn't need much introduction, I suspect, but he's a very humble and unshouty guy. So I'm gonna sing his praises just for a moment. Uh, Ronan has had a, a stellar career across geographies and, and sectors. Uh, and prior to Google, Ronan started out in Mitsubishi um, and had nine year stint in Japan, which is an uh, interesting feature of anybody's career. A uh, bit of a spell in private equity, but it's 15 years at Google, which probably defines uh, Ronan's um, uh, uh, success. Um, rising to the position of MD and VP for Google and Ireland. Um, so we've had some wonderful people on the show, but perhaps, um, and more so that Ronan has, has huge pressure and spotlight um, in his role. So we've had some people who are, you know, quite quiet. So for example, uh, uh, Paul Polman is very much, you know, he manages his affairs in private. Whereas if you're leading Google, everything you do is kind of, as a, as a business and a person, is probably very, very public. Um, so every, every decision in the public eye, and that brings a pressure. And to be honest, it's not a position I'd necessarily envy. And I can imagine often, Ronan, you have the weight of the world on your shoulders. But from my point of view, you keep a very balanced perspective, very chilled out, very relaxed. Um, perhaps sailing plays a part in that, we'll come on to that. But I, I'm really excited to hear from a leader who knows how to deal with pressure uh, in leading a significant part of one of the most ambitious and successful companies on the planet. Uh, and here we're going to hear about Ronan's journeys and, and views on the world. So I'm sure you have lots of questions, um, but for now I'm going to hand over to Richie. Welcome you again, Ronan, and over to you, Richie. Thank you. And thanks, Mark. And Ronan, well, what a pleasure to have you on this morning. Just awesome, awesome that you could spend some time with us. Um, Ronan, I'm just going to kick off and ask, I mean, you know, we talked a little bit about what you've been up to over the last couple of months in lockdown. How, how have you managed things? Um, it's, well, listen, I think if um, Google can't pivot to a digital work from home, uh, who can? So um, <laughs> I guess I'm fortunate that uh, you know, I work in a company where we've naturally got all of the tools and the bits of equipment. Um, so, and we're kind of used to working from home. But even for us, it was it was a big step. Um, but I'm really proud of how the team has managed to um, pick up uh, work from home and still continue doing an amazing job for our users and for our advertising partners and clients. Yeah, I mean, it's many challenges, as you say, and I, I obviously work with your, your your company a fair bit and was impressed that there was a, a policy to help people to sort of kit out their home yeah. office, um, which you know, shows empowerment and trust. So do you want to say a little bit more about the, the why and the what of that? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think, listen, first and foremost, um, you've got to make sure that your people are uh, set up and uh, able to do their job. And um, when, when many of us left the office, I think it wasn't clear just how long lockdown was going to be and um, I you know some people left stuff in their desk that they thought they'd be back to pick up in a couple of weeks and uh, so we kind of headed out of the office we have our laptop under our arm and next thing we're told we're going to be working from home for you know six to twelve months and you're kind of going well can I really spend all of this time every day staring at my laptop hunched over on a kind of the table in the kitchen or wherever it is so it was important to us that we got our people set up so that they could uh, work properly for a sustained period of time. So we uh, allocated everybody a budget um, so that they could get their home working environment kind of correct. Uh, we supplied them with proper equipment, you know, monitors, etc. So really to try and make sure that they had a, a, a sustainable uh, environment over the long term. And even when we did the first wave of that, you know, that was back at the beginning of lockdown. And now we're looking at it and trying to think, well, what are the other things that we need to think about? You know, if this is going to be another, you know, this is going to extend to next summer or, you know, who knows how long. 
what are the other things that we need to do? So what are the uh, different kind of online tools and ways of working and communicating with each other that we need to think about? Um, and we're going to kind of continuously asking ourselves those questions. Uh, I think it's one of the great things about Google is we've always been, we've had teams who have always spent a lot of time thinking about what are other ways of working, uh, other types of tools that we can use, and we're not afraid to experiment either. So uh, I kind of feel fortunate about that. Ronan, let me, let me take you back on, onto your career. So, so clearly spent some time in Japan. Love to know, did you, did you learn Japanese? I did. Yeah, I did. I did. The, um, so, I mean, the early part of my career is, uh, I think anybody in my position probably has two versions of the story for their career. So there's the, uh, you know, I came out of the womb with a well manicured plan that I followed to the letter uh, for the last 48 years. And here I am. Right. So, uh, but that's not what happened. Surprise. Um, I, you know, uh, trundled my way through school, uh, plenty of ups and downs there. Uh, when I came out of school and I was, you know, I wanted to go and be an accountant, God forbid. And my dad said, who was an accountant, said, listen, son, you can be an accountant all you want, but you're going to go and learn something proper first. And uh, then, so he said, you have to go to university. So I selected a university course through a process of elimination so i basically went through the list of courses and scratched off all of the ones i knew i didn't want to do and engineering was kind of the least offensive one that was left so i ended up studying engineering and in the early 90s when i graduated in ireland there wasn't a huge amount of en engineering jobs going and at the time japan was the silicon valley of the world so i said well listen i've studied electronic engineering um, if I want to consolidate that, I should go and learn from the best. Uh, so I started trying to organize myself to uh, go and get a job in Japan. So I did, for the last kind of two years of university, I did night classes once a week in uh, Japanese, which upon arrival in Japan, I realized was a complete waste of time because I, you know, I was deaf, dumb and blind. I couldn't read anything around me. I didn't understand what people were saying. So it was quite the experience, but yeah, so it was by accident, I guess, um, and uh, without a plan of sorts that led me to Japan. And uh, it was a while ago, but <clears throat> I mean, culturally, Japan is very, very different. What were some of the, the uh, most bizarre or interesting or fun things that you experienced? I mean, it was, it, it was all bizarre. Uh, Japan, now a significant part of, I guess, my history, um, and I've got a deep love for it. I was only meant to go there for a couple of years and ended up staying for almost 10. And um, even after 10 years, you walk down the street in a city like Tokyo and you see things that are just mind boggling, you know? Um, so I remember one of the first things I, I, I arrived and I got on the train from Tokyo airport and I was going into, uh, and another train came in the opposite direction. There's this whoom, and I literally jumped out of my skin. And the Japanese guy who picked me up at the airport, was just, he was rolling around on the floor laughing. He just thought this is the funniest thing ever. And then they brought me to the company dormitory. So when you're a freshman, as they call it, at, the, at these big uh, Japanese companies, um, you eat, sleep, live, uh, do everything uh, at the company. So you're in the company dormitory. And uh, I was led down to the shower room which was a bizarre experience for, you know, a young Irish guy who uh, had, a, I guess, a relatively sheltered life, but led into this kind of steamy room with all of these Japanese men sitting up, naked Japanese men sitting on these little plastic stools, throwing buckets of water over themselves and then getting into a bath together down at the end of the, down at the end of the room. And it was kind of like, that was a shock. And literally every day in Japan, you saw things that were just, um, amazing and fantastic and uh, bizarre in so many different ways. Ronan, one of the um, one of the things that Google is notorious for, amongst probably many things, is the job interview. So, mm. how was yours? And uh, is it does does the interview process uh, sort of it is as notorious as it as everyone it seems to be? I, I think it's gotten a lot better, let me say, um, but it was pretty uh, gruesome. I did 14 interviews and uh, was told that uh, that was pretty quick um, uh, back in those days. 
uh, we had, still have, I guess, a philosophy of uh, consensus. Um, so get people to meet, uh, uh, at, get candidates to meet as many people as possible and get everybody's opinion. And if one person says, you know, I don't think Ronan's right for this job, then that carries and Ronan doesn't get the job. And, you know, I, def I, thought, I, I thought it was bizarre as a candidate. And it was quite onerous. When I first got into the company as a manager trying to build teams, I just thought it was ridiculous. It was restrictive. I couldn't hire the people that I wanted to. But then after about a year and you kind of wander around and you realize, actually, all the people I get to work with are pretty amazing and maybe this process works and then you start to really appreciate it for what it does and you know i've been here a long time and uh we've made a lot of adjustments to that process so typically people do four interviews now you'd be glad to know and um but there's still a really rigorous process of peer review of who we're hiring and what they've done before and uh you know we we read what was the discussion in the interviews and we will provide an opinion as to whether we think all of the things that Ronan was asked and answered in the interview were up to scratch. And if not, we'll, set, we'll, we'll, we'll ask people to go back and interview, interview again. Um, so, yeah, gruesome. Well, you uh, I'd heard about the move from 14 to 4, and inevitably, apparently, it was a data-driven decision that 99% of decisions don't change after four interviews. So that, that's very symbolic of the, the data-driven approach. Uh, ju just jumping back to, to COVID uh, for a second, because it looks like we're here for another long haul. Yeah. You mentioned lots of really sort of practical considerations of getting people functioning and efficient. Of course, it's a massive leadership challenge as well. So um, what, what do you think you've already learned from in terms of your own leadership about the, the COVID experience? It, it's a really good question. And I think we're all still um, figuring it out. I think the, you know, and what's really tough, you know, you're running a big team of people and when you're in the office, you get to walk around and see the look in people's face. And you get a sense of, you know, are people uh, energized, are their heads held high, uh, or are people walking around and they're kind of, you know, the, the, the shoulders are down, the head is down, and they're kind of a bit, uh, a bit low energy. And when you're working from home, you don't get to see that. And um, I kick off every week with an all hands for the UK team uh, at 9.30 on a Monday morning. And it's kind of the rah-rah for the week. And I've been doing that now every week for six months. And you get up and you have to be full of energy and you're staring at a screen and you've got no idea if there's even anybody on the other side. You don't know if they think you're mad or bonkers or uh, boring or exciting or if you're talking nonsense, like you've just got no idea. And I found that really hard um, because I get my energy from people. I, you know, I think anybody will like, likes a bit of feedback from the audience. And I found that very difficult. Um, the other thing that I've uh, cleared space for is to make sure that I'm connecting with people as much as possible. So just catching up for coffees. Um, so making sure that there's half hour slots and we, I just get random groups of people. They probably are horrified that Ronan's asked them to come and join for a coffee, but um, hopefully not. And we just have a chat and it's a great way to a clear space, you know, uh, get out of the kind of the rush that we all get into of meeting to meeting uh, and, and just be able to talk to people and hear what's going on and uh, connect to as many people across the business as I can. And I think that connection is something that I've been dialing up and trying to work on um, because it's not natural when you're in a work from home environment. Uh, so yeah, I think that's the thing that's probably been the biggest learning. Ronan, I would, I would uh, genuinely hate to see what your diary looks like because you're probably one of the busiest people on this planet. Um, but you talk a lot about the, the need to have a balance. And I would love to get your thoughts on how, how do you achieve this? So I think um, you've got to be intentional about it, right? And it's really easy, and I found myself falling into this as well. It's really easy, uh, in, been really easy in lockdown to just get caught up in a hamster wheel of 30 minute meetings where you're going from video conference to video conference. And you, know, you, you find you haven't moved in four hours. You know, I, I think at stages I was probably taking routes to my chair. So, I then realized that you've, a, you've got to take control of your day, right? And you've got to uh, just own it. 
And instead of, you know, instead of having great things to do at the time I wasn't commuting or traveling to meetings, um, I was finding that I was spending that time just doing more meetings. So I've tried to just grab that. Um, so things like, you know, I walk my kids to school um, and unless there's something really important, I will walk my kids to school. And um, then equally, I can, I'll have dinner with them in the evening. And that's been a real privilege of the whole lockdown experience, I think, for so many of us. Um, the other thing I've been trying to do is, you know, at the end of a month, I actually go back and look at my calendar and book it, you know, over the last month, how have I spent my time between my team, my customers, um, our other kind of partners and important relationships, as well as my family, but also myself, right? And say, have I, you know, when I look at that, is the balance right? And you look at it some months and you go, my God, you've spent far too much time um, uh, kind of doing work stuff and not enough time on family. And you kind of go, well, I'm going to balance that next month. And invariably the plans go out the window, right? It all gets mushed around, but at least it gives you that sense of what you need to tweak. And it gives you a, a, a kind of a, a frame of reference to be able to make uh, decisions. And I've, I, you know, I'm lucky. I've got a team of people that help me take, you know, can take stuff off my plate when I ask them. And um, that's, that, that, that's one of my privileges as well. So you've talked about a couple of silver linings there. And, you know, I think we've all experienced, you know, don't get me wrong, it's not a good thing, but the, the pandemic has brought some silver linings, including family time. When we all go back to normal, wonderful thing as it will be, what are the, some of those silver linings that you're really determined to hold on to? So I think the... Um, I, I think some of the flexibility that we've all learnt how to do uh, that's now become part of our lives in terms of work is something that uh, I really want to keep, right? So it's clear to me that for my job and for most of the people I work with, uh, it is not necessary to be in the office five days a week from nine to five, right? So figuring out how to maintain that um, and what's, but on the flip side, and there's a balance to this, I know that when we come together as a team, that collaboration, that energy that we kind of get off each other um, is, you know, it, it's very special and it's very difficult, if not impossible, to completely replicate in a remote setting. So I want to keep some of that flexibility, keep some of that balance, keep some of that, you know, time we all get back from not commuting and make sure that we use it for things that are constructive and, and, and good for us as individuals, not just for doing more work. I really like that thought. And, and, and Ronan, in terms of, um, you know, clearly it's a difficult time for so many people, but perhaps really acutely as young people currently going through a lot um, mm -hmm. at this moment in time, whether it's thinking about their careers, whether it's even disruption to their social life that we're sort of seeing all around. Um, I mean, what's, what advice would you have for, for youngsters at the moment, uh, particularly looking at career choices um, at, at this difficult moment? Advice for young people. So, yeah, choose an industry, I think, that is uh, exciting to you and that is growing. Uh, one of the pieces of uh, advice I got a long time ago is if you get a chance to work in a company where you can get the email address of your first name at company.com, then you should probably do that if it's in the right industry and you like the company. Um, and uh, my, I'm, I'm Ronan at google.com, so I kind of, I, I got that one right. Um, but I think that choice of industry, uh, and then make sure that you do stuff that you enjoy doing, um, and ideally with people that you enjoy working with. And, but always be open, I think, to um, kind of left field possibilities. You know, I think through my career, it was always, you know, somebody I'd met recently who pinged me and said, would you think about this thing? And that it was never kind of a straightforward logical path that I followed. It was always, and even within Google, it was slightly odd things that popped up on my plate uh, that were the opportunities that I took. Um, and that ability to keep an open perspective and see what's going on around you so that you can grab uh, an interesting opportunity as it goes past, I think is uh, important as well. Yeah, but just keep the faith up. Try and choose an industry that's growing. I uh, put a big uh, shout out in that one for um, the whole area of marketing and technology. I mean, these are industries that are going to 
uh, be really exciting over the next few years. Yeah. Uh, so um, you, you said at the beginning, life isn't perfectly choreographed, uh, and uh, we've all had our ups and downs. So, it, are there any times you'd say you failed spectacularly? Failed spectacularly. Um, yeah, I think you've got to, right? I think if you don't, um, you're probably not trying hard enough, I think is, uh, and we've actually at, at Google got data to prove that now. Um, so we have data that shows it, the more experiments you do and the more failures you have, the higher the number of uh, successful products that you can churn out of your engineering team. So uh, there is data there to prove this one. But for myself, uh, yeah, no, I have. I think I've made some um, wrong career choices um, or I have been on the kind of receiving end of bigger decisions that I felt like really set me back and both in Google and at Google, outside of Google. And when, when those things happen, you, you kind of sit down and you, you know, you, you pick yourself up on the floor and you have a good chat with yourself and decide, well, am I going to go and play a different game and kind of get, get myself a different job and go somewhere else? Or am I going to dust myself off and get back into it? And um, uh, I think every situation is, is, is different. You've got to assess it. Um, and I've made those decisions, you know, uh, a number of times over the course of my career. And um, I think it was kind of, they, they often create turning points, right? Um, and I think one of those turning points probably was kind of ultimately led to me having a conversation with somebody and uh, 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 coming to have a chat with Google. Um, so, yeah, even the, even, even the difficult moments can turn out to... Uh, uh, produce exciting opportunities in my view. Wow. And, and Ronan, I love the thought when you said, you know, you get the choice between either going to play another game or dusting yourself off. I think that's brilliant um, as, as that choice is. And in fact, um, Matt um, from, from TSP, um, hi Matt, um, just got a question for you quite related to this. Um, and he talks about what, would, what advice would you have for someone considering moves to different sectors? Um, you talked a little bit about your journey, but you know how would how do people people find it quite difficult to actually jump from one sector to the next? Um, do you have any advice for people in that respect? Thinking about that. Yeah. So I think um, so. So the people within my team, what what I say to them is try and get some exposure or experience to this new thing that you want to do. Uh, and very often, you know, if it's moving kind of from one discipline to another within a company, if you can find a bit of extra time. Um, and talk to folks, they, they'll often give you a project or stuff to work on with them and gives you a sense of what's going on. I think if you decide you want to change industry, then you've just got to go for it. And one of the best examples I know of this and uh, somebody I'm extremely proud of is uh, my sister who had a, you know, a long and successful career in um, investment banking and then decided that she wanted to move more towards kind of technology and um, Anyway, so she stepped out of her investment bank. Uh, she spent, uh, I think, six or 12 months doing uh, some courses in digital marketing and digital technology, and then went and got a, you know, got an internship and uh, has progressed from there and is now um, managing director of, a, 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 for UK and Ireland of another, of another uh, tech related company. So when you want to, you can, you, you just got to throw yourself into it. And do your research, identify why it is that you want to go and do that thing and be clear that, you know, far away fields often look greener. So be very realistic about what it is that and why it is that you're going to go and try and do it. And then go and talk to people and ask them to help you get into that new thing. And if you can, if you can get somebody's attention and have a conversation with them and talk to them about why you want to do it and display a bit of passion, I'm pretty sure you'll find folks who are willing to give you a give you a chance, give you an opportunity, whether that's a project or an internship or whatever it is, but just to get your foot in the door and get that little bit of experience. So um, your sister's also quite impressive. Uh, so um, high, high performing family, um, but where you know you're clearly very energetic and resilient. Where do you think that actually comes from? Uh, yeah, it's good good question, um, and. I think I haven't always felt that way. Um, I don't think uh, I've always felt as kind of strong and uh, resilient. And I think some of the experiences I've had over life have taught, has taught me that uh, actually 
you know, you can get through these things. So, you know, I think going to Japan uh, as one example, you know, you suddenly, and this was back in the, you know, email wasn't a thing back then, just to tell you how long ago that was. Um, but you find yourself on the other side of the world uh, where, you know, you want to communicate to your family and friends. You've actually got to write a letter and stick it in a letterbox and wait two weeks until they get it and wait two weeks more until it comes back. So that was very isolating. And I had some very lonely, uh, difficult moments over there where it was, yeah, it was just, it, yeah, it was just awful. And, but you get through it, you know, and you come out the other side and, I think when you come out the other side of a difficult moment, you, you know, you should congratulate yourself and you should think, well, if I can do that, I can, you know, I could handle that again. If it, like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't look for it, but I could handle that again if it came to me. And now what happens is when I come up against difficult situations, I think about, and I think innately now I do this, I say, what, when I'm assessing the risk, I say, what's the worst possible thing that can happen? So what's the worst possible thing that can happen here? And could I deal with it? What would be my, what would be my exit? And if I can deal with that, then it's worth having a go at it. And if something unexpected comes at me, then, you know, again, I ask myself, what's the worst thing that like, what's the worst outcome of this thing? And can I deal with that? And that usually gives me the kind of the confidence uh, to keep on going. But I listen, I won't shy away from the fact that I still have my bad days when you have an onslaught uh, of stuff coming at you from all different directions and it feels interminable and it, you know, you feel it getting you down and sapping your energy. And uh, yeah, so, you know, I have my difficult days, but often I find that if I can get some headspace, whether that's through exercise or hanging out with my kids, um, that usually helps clear the mind a little bit and you can kind of have another go. And Ronan, perhaps related to this, we've got a question from Selena. Hi, Selena. Um, and and uh, she asks about how do you handle people um, such as customers, commentators, media, even family members um, who are perhaps critical of your company and perhaps what you do? How do you, how do you get through that? Yeah, and there's a lot. Um, <laughs> uh, there's a lot. And sometimes it's... Um, you know, you can't get everybody to agree with you. It's the other kind of obvious thing in life. So if somebody's willing to sit down and have a really kind of rational argument, um, I will engage and kind of spend the time with them. But I've also realized that uh, some people just don't want to understand what your point is. And you've just, you've got, you've got to let them get on with it um, and just accept that they're never going to believe uh, anything that you want to say. There's also a lot of people who attack us, attack me because it suits their commercial interests. And, um, um, you, you know, they'll try and uh, uh, take a lump out of us any chance they get um, because it helps their own agenda. And I've come to understand a little bit more when that's happening and accept it for what it is. But, uh, you know, there are times when we get things wrong as well. And that's difficult. And uh, on a few occasions, I've had to stand up in front of clients and apologize. And I take that stuff really, really personally. And um, if I thought that we weren't going to be able to fix something or we'd intentionally done something or that we were, you know, I think the integrity of um, your team and what you're trying to do and the products you're selling is super important. You've got to feel like you can stand behind that stuff. And uh, I think that gives you the confidence to keep on going and deal with the detractors. Uh, and I'm, again, very lucky that we've got, uh, you know, we're not perfect, we make mistakes, but we have an incredible business that is based around trying to help people. You know, we want to build products that help billions of people around the world, that help millions of businesses find the customers that they need. And uh, I think that's, a, that's a, a, a mission that I believe in and uh, my team does. And I think that we can uh, accomplish a lot when we do it. And that, when you believe that and when you've got the integrity of that mission behind you, I think it gives you the confidence to uh, deal with the detractors head on. Sorry, Supreme. Um, so um, who have been your role models and inspiration that have given you this strength, resilience and perspective? Um, my role models are, you know, I've always had, so my, my, um, 
my parents, uh, I guess, played a part in that. Um, you know, my dad was always a super hard worker and uh, uh, built up his career and kind of uh, did well for himself. Um, but my mum was a physiotherapist and she worked with um, kids who have uh, cystic fibrosis. And uh, she would get really involved with the kids and with their families. And I got to know many of them as I was growing up um, as friends. And um, just seeing the way in which my kind of mum dealt with those families when they're going through really tough times, because invariably, you know, certainly back in those days, uh, it was a, a, a condition that uh, never ended well. And people ended up being very sick over a long period of time. Um, so I think that was one of the very early experiences uh, in my life that um, always made me feel fortunate. Uh, and uh, lucky and I think again even when you have a kind of a bad day uh, I, I would always kind of come home from my bad day at school or whatever it was and you know mum would be talking about some tragedy that's ha happened with a family that we've come to know quite well. Uh, so I think that was one of the really early experiences that built up my uh, resilience um, and admiring how my you know looking back now and admiring how uh, my parents would uh, deal with that. I think through my professional career, you know, I'd have to call out Eric Schmidt as somebody who um, I think an incredible business leader. Uh, I got to kind of work um, and be kind of mentored and kind of tutored by him on a number of occasions over the years and uh, always really admired his uh, vision and his understanding of uh, the kind of the strategy that was playing out in the industry uh, and his determination to go out and achieve certain things uh, and it's very easy to call out successful people uh, but I think Eric was somebody who and still is somebody who is uh, incredibly insightful has a real depth of understanding of how technology and the landscape of technology is going to evolve over the next couple of decades and um, uh, I, I, I still find it fascinating listening to him. Uh, I tell you, Ronan, how, how incredibly fortunate to, to have the opportunity to be, to be mentored by someone like that. Just a, a true legend. I mean, incredible. Um, Ronan, we've got so many questions coming in. So I'm just going to give you two quite diverse questions, but you can kind of take yeah. them at the pace. Um, so the first question is from Raju, um, based in Jeddah. Um, hi, Raju. Nice to see you again. Um, he asks, um, are there any sort of interesting insights that you can um, talk to um, that that are coming through through Google, perhaps some search terms, maybe the top, top three topics that are coming up at this point in time um, that may be interesting. Um, and then the second question is perhaps more career related. Um, and it's all around at the moment, uh, people clearly are going through a lot of flux in their careers. How do people manage when people, uh, when, when they, when potential job opportunities come up and, and people say they're overqualified for a position? How would you navigate that? Sure. So, um, so on the first one, if you haven't already, I definitely recommend that you go and uh, play around with Google Trends. So just do a search for Google Trends and you can get in there and you can, you know, if you're a data junkie, and I have to say I love data, uh, you can get lost in Google Trends for uh, a couple of hours just seeing all of the funny dynamics of what people are looking for. Um, some of the things that have uh, surprised me you, you know over lockdown we've seen a massive jump in the number of searches for near me and local and that's kind of obvious another one that is probably a bit more surprising is uh, a massive spike in the searches for puppies so uh, particularly in the London region we've seen a huge spike in the number of searches for people looking wanting puppies uh, I guess everybody's spending more time at home now and they they, they want a companion and uh, it's led to uh, I think a huge spike in prices for puppies so if you're in the market for a puppy I think be careful um, it's a, definitely a supply and demand economics playing out there. Nice um, and, you, and the question about um, overachieving um, or overqualified for particular roles how do you navigate that? Yeah listen I think um, be passionate and never take no for an answer and um, uh, if somebody says you're overqualified, say, you know, if you're, for example, if you're changing industries or if you're going for a role and you really want to work in that company, uh, go back to them and say, I'm, I may have a lot of experience and qualifications, but I'm, this is why I'm really passionate and this is why I think this role is good for me. And this is why I think it's at a level that I really want to come and demonstrate to you and show you what I can do. 
and try and have that conversation. And so I think, uh, yeah, just always be passionate and go for the thing that you really believe is right. In terms of um, following your beliefs, what are your ambitions for yourself and for Google in the coming years? Beyond COVID, you know, in the, when we're back to normal, whatever normal is. What, what yeah, good, 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 good question. I think the, um, you know, we've seen this massive acceleration of uh, technology adoption over the last six months. And we have been racing to try and support people and uh, help them deal with that. And um, so, you know, I want us to continue to play a key role in that. Um, and there's, there, there's two segments of people here. There's, there's businesses. So every business now is trying to figure out how do, they, how do they become more digital and whether that's to enable their people to work from home or to move more of their business online. Uh, there are things that we can do to really help. And um, the other one is, you know, with individuals. Uh, so everybody's job, all jobs now are becoming much more digital. And certainly in the UK, the level of training isn't there. So we've been putting uh, programs in place to go out and try and train people uh, to give them digital skills that, that it's not just a, a, you know, a nice course to go and sit and watch or enjoy for a few hours, but that actually gives them real impact uh, on the far side where they can get a new job or a better job with these skills. And uh, we've been ramping up that program um, and trying to reach an awful lot more people. Uh, that's going to become so important over the next uh, year or two uh, with, you know, both the, the shift in the economy towards digital, but also the, 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 the kind of the fallback in uh, economic activity. So we've, I think we've got a big role to play there. And um, my team and I are really passionate about going out and trying to reach as many individuals with those skills trainings uh, and then businesses and help them get online. And whether it's the kind of small local store um, to the, you know, large company who's trying to shift their business into an online world, I want us to be there and trying to play a role. Just one, just one follow-up question there. Um, Richie and the School of Marketing is all about digital skills, digital learning as well. Um, is face-to-face -face learning dead or, or is there a major disruption to the establishment of learning per se, do you think? Yeah, it's one of these, I've had this debate regularly over the years and I think it's one of these, you know, industries, if you think of education as an industry, um, it largely hadn't changed in a hundred years. You know, it was, you get a gang of people into a room, put somebody knowledgeable at the front and the blackboard and a piece of chalk and off they go. And then at the end of it all, you do an exam. So I think it has changed because I think we are all now much more used to doing stuff like this, where we can uh, listen, watch somebody and then get into a conversation and debate the topics. I think the, uh, you know, and why would you, ex why would you endure a terrible uh, teaching experience when you can also watch a YouTube video and have the world's best teach you on the same subject. So I do think um, we're at a point where this learning uh, experience needs to evolve quite dramatically. And I think the role of uh, educators moves to uh, how, how do you bring the right groups and diverse groups of people together so that they can debate and stretch and pull and uh, get really stuck into a topic. And then the, the, the other part of it, so creating those communities, and then the other part of it is, how do you certify people uh, on the knowledge that they've built up so that when they go out into the world, they have a qualification that's recognized and that employers will look at and go, oh, this is valuable. And we know that this person has the, the, the requisite knowledge to do the job that we're talking to them on. So I think that's how it will shift. I think it will also force everybody to a higher, um, a higher quality of education hopefully as well because um, you know a, li a little bit, bit like when you go shopping online now everybody compares their experience to what happens when they go to uh, for example Amazon or one of their favorite retailers and if they have a bad experience they're kind of go oh, I'm not going to go back there and I think education uh, will uh, become like that as well and I see it in my kids my kids are 10 and 12 and uh, you know they compare everything to the best thing that they've seen online and they're not afraid to uh, they're not afraid to tell you. Uh, and I'm regularly told I'm not the best dad, by the way. So uh, apparently there's much better dads that are out there on YouTube, I'm regularly told. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, uh, actually, Mark Ritson said yesterday, if you're thinking about going to university, why would you go to Herefordshire when you can go to Yale? But um, anyway, R Richie, um, back to you maybe for a final question, because time has just flown by. 
absolutely blown by. Look, there's a great question here on the chat that I must ask. Um, head or heart, which one leads you? Uh, probably head. I guess I'm an engineer, so I've got to have to... In Google, we have a phrase, which is, in God we trust, everyone else must bring data. Very good. Absolutely. Yeah, back to that data. Yeah, um, well, we are out of time. We always promise to try and get people away so they can start their busy days at nine o'clock. Um, wonderful, Ronan. Lo lovely to hear your insights. I'm going to end where I started, which is um, it's lovely to hear from somebody who's very humble and unshouty, given their prominence and position and power. Uh, so I know, speaking on behalf of anybody, it's been a real privilege to have you on this morning. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. I really appreciate the invitation and uh, thanks for joining in and listening. And, and Ronan, I just want to echo exactly what Mark said. Look, the, two, the two real takeaways from me is when you said, Far away fields look greener. And that was one of the, one of the things that really struck with me. Um, and then the other one was just never say, never take no for an answer. And I think that's perhaps something that's really held you in amazing stead for the tenacity and persistency that you've had through the years. And that's something that I'm certainly taking away. Um, so thank you. Thank you from, uh, from all of us. Um, just to, sure. to, to, any of the, uh, to everyone watching, um, we've got Dom McGregor on next week, um, 8 a.m., um, same time, same place. Uh, Dom is one of the co-founders of probably one of the most exciting startups now to scale ups and have been sold um, uh, social chain. Um, and he's on next week to talk about his journey and his story. Um, so do tune in. Uh, same time, same place. See you all next week. Great. Good weekends all. Thanks again, Ronan. Cheers. Thank you.